individual basis. What, what's it like competing with uh, on a team? Is it a different dynamic? Yeah, I think it, it is a different dynamic. It's um, what I loved about it is I was always sort of the younger one on the team. I, you know, I kind of retired before I got to be the the senior one on the team, and I think that sort of spirit of of people helping you. I mean, one of the things I love about eventing anyway is that people help each other out. You know, you come back and people say like, "How did Spence four ride?" and you're not thinking, "Oh, I don't want to tell them because I want them to mess up." You're you know, you want to, you want to share the information you have. So I think for me, having the older riders, um, kind of as, as mentors was, was really meaningful. And then I think also there is something about competing for your country, I think, and representing and what that feels like and being part of a group effort to do that, you know? So if you're the first one out, you have a very specific job. If you're the last one out, you have a very specific job. Um, and I, I love that part of it. Um, when you went to um, further prepare for the Pan Am Games and for future endeavors, um, is there something in particular from the World Games you took from that helped you prepare for future competitions? Like that was a that pinnacle point. That's mm. something. That you yeah, I think um, I didn't. You know, I. I had an okay, I didn't, it's interesting, I didn't real. I think, I didn't see the World Games as altogether a different experience, mostly because I'd been living in England, so I've been competing against good people a lot, that's one of the great things about living in Europe, is, you know, you're at a one day with every team member from everywhere, every weekend, <laughs> so yeah. I, I think it was more just another experience in front of big crowds with pressure, and each time you do that, you know, you figure out what did I do well, what did I not do so well, and how can I kind of build on that? Um, I think it's also being, you know, the first time in anything is is new and a challenge. And then once you have that, you know more what to expect. So I think probably those are the things that I took from that time. Mm. Um, what led you into sports psychology or psychology itself? I didn't want to narrow it down to just sports psychology because you do your your profession spreads across a really wide field, doesn't it? Yeah, it can does. You, can you tell us a little bit first what your field in psychology is? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, have a private practice where I see folks um, about kind of what we think of as traditional psychotherapy. So anxiety, depression, um, life transitions, sometimes just feeling stuck and wanting to, you know, move to a different area. Um, I also have special training in couples therapy. So I see a lot of couples in my practice, um, which ironically, I'll often find myself with a sports client bringing something that I use with my couples because relationships are all the same, whether it's with your coach or with your horse or with your partner. So that's kind of fun crossover. Um, and then the other part is is just the sports psychology, which is kind of a, um, a you know a separate a separate part. But I never get I never get bored because I get to do so many different things, which is partly why I love it. What what led you into psychology? I mean, we uh, I think from my experience as a competitor, it's hard to get out of that that track when you're with horses then you get on this competitive streak and there's so, something that i you know myself even i just still want to prove um and you know in your career it was almost like you planned already to go to school and um and then you came back briefly and and went uh back to school or started um, practicing. Um, what, what led you into that field and doing psychology? Yeah, I always, I always joke, people ask me that. I'm always like my crazy family. I had a crazy family. <laughs> so <laughs> always wondering, how does this all work? Um, but really, truthfully, from when I was young, I was always interested just in, in kind of people and what makes people work and what, um, that quickly became like, 
what what's what's making it challenging for people to get where they want to go to um what things get in the way so th that psychology interest was was always there um as kind of a background and then when i was riding i very much i was as you say very competitive and wanted to was always thinking about how to maximize you know how can i be better how can it go better um and I started to look around and say, you know, there's people who ride really well, but aren't generally very competitive. And then there's people who ride well too, but are consistently competitive. And I thought, well, what, what, like, I want that. What is that? What, you know, how do they do that? They're every, you see people who have similar riding levels, but not, but don't compete the same way. So that to me was like, it's not about skill in that sense, it's about how they're using their mind to compete. Um, so I started reading sports psychology stuff. I went to a kind of a short-term condensed sports psychology, oh, it's not like a clinic, but kind of where you go and spend two days looking at your entire mental game, not geared towards riding, just geared towards any sport. Um, and then when I was with the team, kind of 98 through 2000, we had a sports psychologist, Susie Tuffy was working with the team then. And I just found that so helpful and really, really wished that I'd had it earlier. You know, it felt like I would have, I was playing catch up a lot. Um, so when I decided to stop competing, I went back and got my, my graduate degree with just regular psychology. And it's interesting, people would say to me, you know, it's such a natural fit for you. Um, and at that point, sort of to your point, Eric, I was like, I don't know, I I kind of want to be the competitor. I don't know that I want to work with competitors. I think I'll, like, I think that'll be hard. I think I'll feel like I wish I was the one out there doing it. Yeah. Um, but that really transitioned and it's actually become this great way that I get to stay connected to the sport and to kind of what I know and what I love and, um, but by working with the athletes. I know. Um through my journey too when you were working on self-betterment and now there's so many books out there about you know how to improve yourself and and um to the point that my whole library is self-help books <laughs> <laughs> but but it it translates to the writing so well um and it's made me a better horseman do you feel like you wish you had some of the tools you learned now back then or um fall short uh, from from before, but I mean, that's all part of life's journey. It absolutely, it absolutely, for sure. But there's no question, I, I, I do, I feel like I wasted so much time, you know, kind of, and, and what's hard, I think, I don't know, I think, I think this continues to be the culture in the sport, you know, it's a, it's a sport in which people work very hard. And that's actually, just, this is true across the board with sport, but i really felt like if I was having fun, I wasn't working hard enough. And if I was not just really being hard on myself all the time, you know, yeah. like that, that, that was kind of the way to improvement. And, you know, you know, from all the books on your shelf, that's, that's really not true. Like it turns out you're handicapping yourself. Um, so I think though, for me, those are the biggest things I wish I had known then. Well, speaking of being hard on yourself, um, one of my first uh, main questions on that might help out a lot of our viewers, I think we all are a little self-conscious when we're riding in front of others. Um, I know sometimes when I'm riding by myself, I'm just extremely focused. My horse is going really well. I'm listening to my horse. I have a goal in mind. Everything's very calculated. And then somebody comes out and watches and they don't even have to say anything. And all of a sudden our brains just go to another dimension. We all of a sudden ride harder. Um, sometimes it's almost fear of not measuring up to what they're seeing or, um, or fear of screwing up. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Or do you have any clients that have anything like that happening? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I might absolutely. just be speaking of myself, but <laughs> no, 
No, I think you're not alone. I would say you're not alone. Um, you know, it's a really interesting question because there's there's a lot, there's some different things going on, right? Like there's what you say, like my mind, my mind is very much here and focused. And then all of a sudden it's out there. It's away. It's no longer kind of doing what I want to do. So that piece is um how do I develop a relationship with my mind? Like our minds are are busy, you know, they're like this and then this and then that. That's how they're wired. So the more we can do in, you know, traditional mindfulness practice, whatever kind you do, um, which is essentially sitting quietly, focusing on something, your breath, sound, can be a mantra, and then noticing when your brain goes off and congratulating yourself that you noticed and then bringing it back. So you you start to develop that kind of um, capacity with your mind, right? So that nothing else, so when it leaps off, you notice that it leaps off to like, oh my God, they're watching. And then you have the capacity to start to bring it back. So that's kind of a, a baseline piece. Um, I think the other piece that I work with people on is really separate from that time when you're riding in the indoor, but really connecting in like for you, I would say, Eric, like what, why, you know, why do you ride? Why do you train? Why are you not, you know, home knitting? Like, what is it that is really compelling to you? And my experience is that when people and this, it takes a little uncovering. And when people really connect into that, th that becomes a, a point for them. So they notice, because they've been doing this mindfulness, they notice that their brain goes off there. And then they kind of bring it back to whatever their intention is, whatever their North Star is, which allows them to like, drop back into the present moment of the ride or whatever they're doing. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, just to clarify, I think it's um, because I teach a lot of students and they are so hard on themselves um, that to find why you ride, you could start knowing why you ride for yourself instead of getting sidetracked to your Facebook media posts and, and stuff comparing. And even for I know some of us, especially up here in Wisconsin, when the winters get so cold, to be motivated to ride, sometimes we feel ashamed that we don't feel motivated to ride, and we're trying to get ourselves in the game, and um, uh, and, and, and until the momentum kicks in. Um, but to know why uh, you ride and that feeling is is a big deal. Yeah, I think that's really right. There's a Nietzsche quote, which I just will torture, so I'm not even going to try it, but it's basically like the the why is, you know, is everything, you know, kind of the, the, the yeah. why is the driver, you know, and I think that's really, really, you know, true for people. And um, it, it, it'll start up high, you know, with like, I want to win that competition, or I want to, you know, um, represent my country for a team, or I want to, you know, compete my training cross country course, but then you get a little deeper, like, why, you know, what does that, what does that mean to you? What does that give you? And what do you, um, you know, people choose people who ride, choose horses, like there's something about that connection. They're not, you know, racing bikes, or they're not skiing, but they, and, and really, um, Locking into that for folks, I think, is another way that's helpful to. Yeah, well, yeah. I think also, you know, we, when we search back about when we first encountered horses and our first ride and we wanted to do it again, um, I think we really find out the why there. And as life goes by and you spend X amount of money and X amount of time and all of a sudden we're trying to validate it and then we're trying to chase our tail um really trying to validate our sport um and instead of the love that we had as kids or the amateur adult that started riding uh, for the love of the horse yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a really good point and that that relationship and then as you say the more you chase your tail the 
worse it goes usually. What are what are, what is a tool to help somebody get um, instead of getting triggered to that distraction? What's one tool in particular that you, you could tell any of us to get ourselves back in focus? So yeah, while, you, while you're in the ride. Yeah, and that's a great question. So I'd say do a little bit of the background so you kind of have that. Um, what, you know, what that is to connect into for yourself, you know, kind of what, what your purpose is, so to speak. And then what's really helpful when you're in your ride, there's a lot of people that, um, the tactile is helpful. So having a ritual that you do, some people kind of like push their knuckles together or, or push their hands down, or some people will tap their horse, like some sort of movement that, is paired perhaps with your purpose, you know, like, um, if I can think of one that someone uses, um, you know, so slow down is sometimes one for people, you know, just do my job. Um, kind of like an action you're in control of. Yeah. An action you're in control of kind of paired with an idea, like, a um, um, just do my job, um, slow it down right here right now because what, what oh you're thinking of a mantra a mantra paired with some kind of a physical thing like so some people uh, will slap out their elbows some people will but the, the actual physical tactile helps us to kind of reset reorient so like we've gotten distracted we started thinking about someone else you know i i bring myself um physical touch helps to like bring our body back into the moment that we want to be in which is sitting on the horse right there that kind of time. like breathe deep breathe deep sit deep <laughs> yeah, yeah totally that's a, that's a great one i think you know <laughs> you know the other piece i think we can't um forget is, is important in this conversation is what do we have control over that's that's probably a question that comes up so often when i'm working with clients you know, to ask ourselves that, you know, like, what do we, do I have control over the weather? What do I have control over? And so if I'm thinking, oh my God, there's the selectors are watching or, you know, there's that important person or there's, you know, is really is kind of helpful to go through the exercise of what do I have control? Do I have control over what they think about what I'm doing? Yeah. Totally no. So, but I do have a lot of control over what I'm doing here and my best access to all my talent and skill and things that I know is this moment, right? To bring myself back to this horse, this ride. I'm, what am I, what's my goal for this ride? Is it bending? Is it like, you know, so just to, to not worry that you've gone off because your mind will always go off, but to bring it back. And that's sort of the name of the I think, game. I think that uh, leads us into mental practice, doesn't it? You know, where um, maybe we could talk a little bit about mental practice on that focus point because our brain is um, our, our own little playground that doesn't understand the no words and, and such. But if we practice on the positive, what we want and repeat it in our mind. Um, maybe we could um, train our train our brain like a muscle to be able to go that direction. Can you can you talk a little bit about mental practice? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great question. So I think there's I think there's two pieces. Not to harp on the mindfulness piece, but you do have to kind of have that because you have to you can't bring it back or have it be in a positive state or anything unless you know what it's doing. You know, you, you have to kind of have a sense of what's what's happening internally. So mm -hmm. I say, you know, I often say to folks, um, there's really good apps, there's like Calm and Headspace where you can just do five minutes a day, you know, of kind of some kind of a meditation, some kind of a, and people, it's hard. I mean, it's hard to get ourselves to sit down and do it. People would rather do, you know, have me tell them to do anything else except for that but I do think that's an important you know an important piece um the other thing that comes up a lot which I think is connected to what you're talking about is is self-talk you know and you're sort of saying like I 
put the positive in and and that's what I that would be where I would go to. Um, I think there's often a real misconception of like, I should just say, you know, I'm, I'm great. I'm a good rider. I'm strong. I'm going to win this weekend, you know, and that that should then produce the result. Um, I think it's, that's not been my experience. Uh, my experience has been that you have to really connect into the the hard things that you've done, the difficult things that you've done, whatever your, you know, confidence essentially is our belief that we can do the task that we're being asked to do. So in order to have confidence, we have to, one, be able to do the task. We can't, you know, I can't suddenly say like, I'm going to be Michael Phelps. And no. Confident about that. Um, but what then you people say, well, what how do I get confident? What gives me confidence? You know, and what gives us confidence is doing hard things and getting through them. And then there's this other step which we lose, which is um acknowledging and owning that we've done the hard thing and that we have that skill, you know, so mm-hmm. that the stories that we tell ourselves instead of can't believe how you screwed that up and got to be better. And, you know, that kind of a thing. It's like, okay, you know, this was hard, but look what you did here. Look what you did here. You're, you know, these are, this is what you're good at. You're a good competitor, you know, I, I, but really based in hard experience, as opposed to kind of like pie in the sky, positive aphorisms or it's, a, it's almost more and more more objectifying your rides or objectifying what it is that you're doing and just peeling it back to the doable levels. Yeah, I think that's I, I often think um, there's sort of two pieces that very much go together, right? There's like the what I'm doing, so making sure that if I, for example, if I've lost confidence and I'm trying to, you know, gain that, that a lot of people who I see that that's the reason they've come, right. Is that they sort of, they've, they've lost confidence or they've had a fall or they don't feel like they're competing as well as they want to be. So there's the kind of hard side of the training and like what, what's happening in the training. Can we look at that? Is that, is that backing you up? Is that, getting you where you need to go in that direction. Um, and then there's the piece about like, how am I thinking about my challenges? Am I, am I seeing them as failures? Am I seeing them as like, what did I learn from that situation? You know, what can I, what can I take forward? And am I connecting to what my true strengths are and, mm-hmm. and bringing those everyone? I don't talk to a client who doesn't have some really core strengths that they maybe hadn't quite identified and once they connect to them that they can lead with that you know I'm the kind of person that um you know really stays in even when it gets hard you know I ride well in the wet conditions because I'm that kind of person or whatever it is can I can I ask you a little bit um when you're um obviously you were very successful as a competitor but um, as being very competitive, I'm sure you had your story with perfectionism. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with perfectionism and how you overcame that? Yes, that's a good question. Perfectionism is actually one of the things that I wish I had known earlier because I, I very much um, was a perfectionist. There's this idea of perfectionism on a continuum that I really like. I don't know if you've come across that, but it's kind of sort of functional perfectionism to down to what we think of as more dysfunctional perfectionism. (laughs) The idea is, you know, perfectionism has a lot of good things with it. You know, I always say to people, like it gets you to the barn at four in the morning. It gets you to keep practicing that shoulder in on, you know, again and again and again. It, it's a driver for sure. And that's, that's an energizer. That's a motivator. That's an, that's a positive thing. Right. 
um, where it gets tricky. So I sort of feel like it goes up, it's helping you, helping you, helping you, and then it kind of gets up here. And then where it starts to drop off, where it then hurts you and certainly hurt me, was which is to, I want to get better. I want to do this expansive kind of like, how can I get bigger and better to, oh, like, I don't want to mess up. I don't, I don't want to fail. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to mess up. What do I have to do to not mess up? And you kind of get like smaller and tighter. Yeah. Um, and that's the point where it becomes really destructive for people. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all, it's like a positive plane and a negative plane. All of a sudden it just switches. It switches. That's right. Exactly. And so I'm always, you know, thinking together with people about what, you know, a question I like to ask a lot for people is, is the way I'm thinking about this thing, this competition, this ride, this um, lesson, you know, is it, is it helping me to get where I want to go? Or is it sort of keeping me from where I want to go? And if it's, if, if it's the latter, then I need a new, equally true, it can't be an untrue story, but I need a new frame. I need a new story. Like how else could I think about this that would help me move into it as opposed to get tighter and move away from it? Very good. I, I, um, I heard a story of um, Michael Phelps, and I think this could help us out with the uh, mental practice of uh, trying to avoid the perfectionism and some of the other qu uh, questions we went through. Um, he would have, his coach would tell him to play the videotape. Hmm. Have you heard that story? I haven't, uh, no. Well, uh, his coach would tell him to play a video, play the videotape. So hmm. Michael Phelps knows how many strokes it takes to go across the pool to how many breaths to the point where he even knows what song he's listening to as he comes out uh, out on the stage, what foot, what, what leg he takes out of the sweats first, to what foot he puts on the podium first, to um, what finger he places wherever, you know, it's just everything is so detailed mm -hmm. in every move to the podium, stepping on a podium to his dive in, to how many strokes, to how many breaths, to, to knowing that split second when he's going to complete the race. And it's like he's got a mental videotape of everything coming from the locker room to the preparation, to getting on the podium, to entering the pool, to en exiting the pool, and the race is done, the video is done. Um, can you, I, I've heard you do a lecture on perfectionism with the USEA and it sounds like you're coaching people to play their own video from driving to the barn and I love that exercise if you could uh, if you remember if you could explain that to our audience from driving up the driveway taking a breath to um, finding us in a routine that we sometimes a lot of us have day jobs and and we're trying to fit in our ride and or talk ourselves even out of our ride in the end. Oh, I'll just get back to my family because I feel the pressure of the family back home and I need to get done. Um, I love to give our viewers some tools for when they pull into the driveway. And first of all, I give them a lot of credit for coming to the barn. But how are they going to make that time efficient enough to attack their horses, get on their horses, ride their horse in a, a way and not get too overwhelmed with the perfectionism of whether or not their boots are polished right away. <laughs> and, and then uh, find themselves ending a nice workout and feeling like they've accomplished something going home. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm not, it's funny. I'm not sure I'm remembering that the exercise that I talked about at the USDA, but I do have a lot of ideas for that. Yeah. So Oh, please share. Feels helpful. Um, there's a couple of things. I think one of the things that made me think of was transitions and transitioning from work to the barn and yeah. 
understanding maybe in our car ride that that's what we're doing and kind of it'd be easy to just keep thinking about work all the way to the barn or start worrying about our ride, you know, in the drive. But if we kind of notice that that's a transition, I think that's a place where there's a lot of good research on music and mood. So I think that's almost a great place to whatever music, you know, some people it's like Bach, some people it's, you know, rock and roll, whatever music kind of helps you to feel, um, you know, positive and, and, um, for me, it's the Rocky theme. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's a great, that was always a before cross country one for me. Yeah. It kind of depends on what your ride's going to be, maybe what music you choose, you know? Right. But actively having that. Um, another thing that the sports psychologist, when I rode for the team, really was big on was before your ride, knowing what you were going to work on, you know, so being really clear that, you are working on, you know, this canter lead and maybe that shoulder in and, um, and then going and working on that. And then when it was done, it was done. You know, I think yeah. we could all fall prey to just a little more, just, oh, now I got to get that. And oh God, I got to work on that rain back and I've got to, you know, and then it kind of deteriorates from there. And I think for me, being a perfectionist, having it narrowed down to what my goal the ride was was super helpful and and helpful for the horses too because I could you know I could let it be good enough I could let them be I think that's a I think that's a very good point um and that's where it brought us back to being more objective with your ride versus oh I've got a um you know let's say uh, for our dressage riders um you know, working on a pre-St. George test and I've got to do these threes and fours and that's all you're doing is threes and fours. And why not in, on your hard days, just work on canter walk transitions yeah. and just, you know, be more objectified than that versus I got to get through the pre-St. George test and get this score. Um, just working on one movement or just canter walk transitions to... Um, help the lead changes later on is and then and then you had a um a fun active workout that you could feel successful from yeah i think that's really right and i love that idea too of um that you kind of get to assess i think we all need to do this w where am i today you know what kind of a day is it is it a, is it a you know day to really kind of like go for it on the flying changes or is it been kind of a hard day at work and I'm tired and and as you say yeah how can I be creative and like oh yeah the walk to canter transitions that's really going to benefit me um, yeah that's a great very good well now uh we have that person that goes to the barn and then they go home to their loved ones <laughs> so how does uh balancing life with horses and loved ones work uh, do you have um any uh do you have any clients that come to you going, you know, I, I love my horse. I love my horse sometimes more than my loved ones. I feel like I'm spending more time with them, but, or my, my, uh, partner will, um, hold it against me for seeing my horse or makes me feel in a way that why would you spend all this time at the barn when you're an amateur doing this? You know, um, do you have any, uh, advice for uh, baby couples out there that are um, listening in and going, how do I explain this to my significant other, my, my passion for this? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great question. There's a lot of parts to it. I think um, one piece that's really helpful is to be able to have the conversation with your partner. It's a little bit tying back into what what the purpose is. Like, why do I do this? You'd be amazed that that's not really a question that people ask very often. Like why? Because we, we tend to get on a road. I love horses. I ride, I compete. That's what I do. I'm on the road. And then we're no longer really looking at the road. We're just on the road, you know? So this, this opportunity to be like, what, what's meaningful about it? You know, what is it like, in, in some way, it likely feeds your soul. 
And if you can share that with your partner, then your partner's like, oh, of course, like I want you to have your soul fed. I want you to, you know, feel, you know, kind of connected. I want you to get those moments of exhilaration. Like I want that for you. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that's really helpful. There's also, um, I think sometimes we can make the mistake. It's a little bit tied with a perfectionism thing of like that more is better, more hours, more time, more rides, you know, more, more, more. And of course, to a certain degree, practice is super important. But I had someone say to me once, like, more isn't better. It's just more. And yeah. so I think understanding that actually, if you take some time off, if you go to the movies, if you, you know, go do something with your partner that's, you know, that you both enjoy, that's actually going to benefit your riding. You know, you're going to come back kind of rested, fresher, resourced. Um, and that's, people tend to think it's going to take away, but it actually is a, is a benefit. Uh I'm guilty of that myself. I feel like I'm losing out on a day when I'm not on a horse. And, um, and, yeah, and then I'm surprised uh, uh, how much better attitude I have. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's exactly uh, right. I want to oh, open up some questions for our audience. Um, Molly, do we have any questions coming? Yeah, up? we have one here. And this is a this is a pretty good one. Good. Do you have any tips for uh, to overcome fear of previous scary rides or falls? Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And that's something that that I get a lot, right? Um, there's a there's a few things with that. So I always start, this is actually a, something I take from couples therapy that, and this was helpful just in relationships, that the research shows that in a argument in a discussion with between a couple that it takes five positives to kind of overcome the one negative thing that you say so it, that's you know I think of, and I kind of think of it the same way with with a fall or with something bad that happens your brain is coding that as big and so just on a really basic level you've got to log positive experiences and not just have positive rides, but note, I call it code, like code them, notice that you're having them and really let them land in your neurons the way that the, the fall or the scary thing has landed. Um, you know, the, the science for that, right, is probably, you probably all know it is like our brains are wired for danger or negativity because that's what kept us alive you know it was really important you remember the tiger not so important you remembered the flowers um so we're we're up against that with a with a fall or something scary we're extra velcro for it um so having those positive experiences is really important um it's also you know i feel like i like a broken record with this but working with people and connecting into what, what they, why, you know, I always say like, why riding? Like why cross country if you're a cross country rider? Why jump if you're a jumping rider? Um, there's some, there's something within you that has chosen that as opposed to, I would say like knitting. Um, and, and what, and what is that? And let's connect into that um, and, and see where that is so that that kind of helps to overcome the fear. Um, the, the other piece I think is really important here is um, it, it connects into the five positives to the one negative. I'm, I'm such a believer in like dialing it back when you have a problem in really, there was a year I hadn't, um, well now be a three-star horse and was going to a big three-day. It was, it was a long format and it got eliminated at the horse trials two weeks before the three day and wouldn't jump a corner just to save his life. And every day between that horse trials and the big three day, I jumped cross rails, just, you know, all different cross rails in the ring every single day, like sideways, this way, whatever. And he went to the three day and was, was great, big, huge three day. And I, I always think back to that. So I'm always saying to people, go 
go back. Like I'm a huge proponent of ground rails, you know, and it sounds crazy, but every single day, you know, because nothing gets your eye in, nothing is a lower pressure situation. And you just get in the, you get those positives in your nervous system. And that starts to outweigh the, the fear. Um, I like a key word that you used there was uh, coding. Um, uh, basically, you're coding that positive experience over the negative one, even over a dialed back exercise. So it's like retraining the positivity that can happen from it versus keep doing the same question. And it's a gamble. You're going to probably get a negative, another negative experience. Um, yeah. But you can uh, work on a positive uh, coding, dialing it back and your odds are better there. And, and maybe momentum will take over as you um, try to work your way back up again. I think that's right. And it's, it's, it's momentum and it's fact sort of logging good experiences. You know, it's interesting. I think you see that a lot, you know, when you see someone have a refusal in a and they just really quickly want to like get right back around and jump it again and have the same problem. And I'm always saying, you know, that's a great, like, take the time, you know, breathe. That's a great time to feel your feet in the stirrups, bring yourself back to this moment. And mm -hmm be able to think because because when we get going fast and when we get afraid we actually lose the the frontal part of our brain that's that thinks for us that has all our skills so breathe bring it back what is the one thing I'm focusing on maybe it's my canter maybe it's riding forward maybe it's my turn so I have the opportunity to actually bring that to have the experience go better yeah definitely Molly, do we have any other questions coming in? Because I got a pretty at this point, point. We that that was the last question um, that we had. Uh, is anybody else interested in having a question answered? We I have still another, have some time. I have another question. If uh, if somebody else wants to dial one in, um, back when um, you were competing, um, there wasn't anything as far as social media goes. Um, and today's generation, lots, I mean, everyone's posting everything about their ride and um, it almost looks like they're just posting th themselves on their ride just to validate themselves on that, on that post. Um, what are some, how, how can you, how do you relate with that um, when you have the social media going out there and it looks like really more exciting than the competition that they even went to mm -hmm. um, and others looking at the social media posts that their peers are doing. Um, what some advice can you tell uh, some of our viewers that are really heavily on the social media um, that keeps them healthy in the saddle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a great question. It's a challenge it's a challenge in riding. It's a challenge in, in life. Um, there's a woman I love who says that um, Instagram is like, it's like looking at a showroom. That's someone's showroom. You know, people don't live there. It's a furniture showroom. <laughs> That's just. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I always have that image. Like people don't live there. That's not where people live. Um, I really encourage, I do this with myself and I really encourage it with, with, people I work with to really ask yourself, how do I feel when I'm done looking at, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever it is that you're doing? Like, do I feel, it's kind of the same question. Do I feel more able to move into where I want to go positive, you know, excited, motivated, or do I feel less, less that way? And just to really notice, and you might notice like, oh, when I look at Sally's posts, I feel really motivated. But when I look at Susie's, I just feel like, like I just can't do it and I'm no good, you know? And so it sounds really crazy, but I'm like, don't look at Susie's posts, you know? Um, it, it, it really has an influence on, on our psyche and on our mental um, 
our mental game. So be mindful of if it's a positive one or if it's a negative one. Um, and, you know, kind of edit your social media, you know, accordingly. Um, and then I don't know if it's helpful, Eric, I can, I can talk about also thinking about posting, but I don't, I don't know if that's helpful to... No, please. Yeah, so I think it's, um, it's so easy. You know, we, it's, we really get wrapped up in likes and comments and um, the, the tr and that's all, I think that's all fine and, and good. The, the tricky thing that you have to be aware of is it is, and this is just a little bit of the science, it's like, it's a little dopamine hit, you know? So if we know like the brain, dopamine is a chemical, it's a neurotransmitter in our brain that is zingy. It's like, I like that. I want more of that. And our brains really like dopamine. So each little like is like a baby dopamine hit. But what, what happens is we sort of start to get inured to the, to the dopamine. So it takes more and more and more. And all of a sudden, we, if we don't have 50, 100,000 likes, we don't even feel good. We don't even feel normal. It's no longer we're feeling great. It's like we don't even feel like we can get out of bed. So right. it's, you, it is kind of like a drug that way. We want to be aware of that and why we're posting and what we're wanting and how it's working for us kind of evaluate that yeah and i think have, i think there is some good value behind some of the stuff on facebook like the articles some some videos that we could use as an example a positive example to ride up to uh but the moment we start you know shuffling and comparing ourselves feeling ashamed that we're not matching that i think that's a dangerous place yeah. to be we yeah that's that there's another question in here that i think um if we have a few minutes we might get some insights on do you have any tips on when your horse stops um so sort of kind of how do i how do i think about that what do i i, I think that's what they're intending there yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great question. Um, it's, you know, if it's a one-off stop, we tend to not think too much about it, right? But if a horse starts stopping, my experience is that few things take our confidence away faster because we a little bit get in that, is it, you know, is it happening or not happening? Um, so that's a real place where I, I think the mental is important, but you've got to take care of the physical first. So I'm always thinking, you know, if they just start stopping, like what's going on? Have they been overfaced? Um, am I riding, you know, so erratically that they can't jump? Uh, what's happening? So I'm also, I think sometimes people feel like, oh, I've got to be able to figure it out myself. If I can't figure it out myself, I'm no good. So if my coach gets on and, and rides my horse, that just means I haven't, I'm no good. I can't do it. And I, I think the opposite, I think, um, all of learning in life is kind of scaffolding. Like if you, you know, the voices we have in our heads are the voices that we've heard in our lives. So we have taken those on. So when our coach gets on and rides our horse for us, one, it gives the horse confidence. Two, it gives us confidence to see the horse jumping. It also gives us, a kind of to the Michael Phelps video comment, it gives us a mental image of what it should look like. When we get back on, we have a horse that can, when we do it right, can respond well to us. So I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, in terms of the mental side of it, I think, we really have to know why it's happening, you know, and if we know why it's happening, then we can set up a systematic program to have it stop happening, you know, to, to figure out and, and get confidence and kind of loop into that cycle we were talking about, about how do you, you know, how do you get over fear? You know, Abigail, something that comes to my mind too with this is, uh, um, you've mentioned the why factor a lot. Like, why do I like riding? 
why is my horse stopping? And something that's coming to my mind that I'm just watching, you know, hearing this, a lot of people don't want to work on the why. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would say, you know, most people, they just want, they just want the result. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So I would, I would just say to the audience, the why is definitely hard to work on, um, but it's very worth looking into why. Um, and sometimes you have to peel back a lot of layers to find the why, um, uh, even with a stopping horse, because the moment the horse stops, especially a competitor just says, well, there's 20 penalties. I'm not going to win next weekend. Mm-hmm. And they're already comparing it to the next show instead of going, why is my horse stopping? Let's dial this back because there's a lot of, I, I'm just speaking from experience from other students I've encountered. They're so driven to get these results that they don't want to look in the, in the why because um, we see nothing but success around us getting around horses and, it's, and having a stop is never published on media and all this other stuff. I think social media has just really weakened the, the sport in some ways when we're um, comparing for these results. Uh, yeah. But I think the why is very good, Abigail. Uh, uh, it's just hard for a lot of people to work on that why. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because I think one thing that's really important with that and sometimes why actually, I know I've said it a lot, but sometimes why can be kind of close us down like why 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 and then we just drive ourselves crazy yeah Yeah. I say to people this is another couples therapy thing that they say um when couples come in for therapy they're usually like mad they're like what the hell is this what is going on here why are you doing that what you know in this kind of a of idea and with sports the same why are you stopping you know what what is wrong with me why can't I get it together it's it's that tone Right. And I'm always saying to folks, we, unfortunately, that just shuts us down. Like, we just can't think in that tone. But if we can be like, hmm, what is this? What, like, this is interesting. What's going on? You know, it was going really well, and now it's not. Like, what, if we can be curious um, and and kind of open and not so hard on ourselves, like, hmm, I don't love what's happening right now, but but let's let's look at it a softer kind of approach i think yeah invite I, can, I have to testify to our audience that i've been on both sides of that spectrum um you know and and it's important that, uh, that people know that it's and, and so that you don't feel just so ashamed that you're you blew your temper based on that why 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 and the negative point and then I used to, have, you know, when I was frustrated that way and then took the approach to me going, well, let's look into this and why. And it would almost piss me off, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> but when you, when you do come into a, a calm state and you, and you look at it from an aspect of training instead of, you know, I, I got to get there, um, you really start to... Um, master this equestrian sport yeah Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions out there no we have we're finished with we we don't have any more pending right now um we're about at eight o'clock so yeah i think we covered a lot a lot of information we Uh, really did um uh is there any um any last bits of advice yet you'd like to um just give us um especially yeah. during these winter months. <laughs> Move to Florida. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I feel like music, music is a good thing in the winter. Like music is a good mood enhancer in the winter, I think, you know? Yeah, yeah. Especially when you like driving in the car and you're linking like a musical curve to it. <laughs> you can feel it. Exactly. <laughs> well, Abigail, I, I really want to thank you. Um, I, I've always admired your, uh, your work um, and just uh, loved watching you compete and, and now seeing you really helping a lot of other people with their um, skills and bringing the best out of themselves. And 
uh, really appreciate you offering your time for us uh, today and uh, would maybe uh, love to invite you again in the future, maybe when we have a, a little bit more of a, um, maybe something in particular that we could discuss. Absolutely, it's been it's been such a pleasure. It's really, I think I said to you when we were offline in the beginning for me to get to talk about courses and kind of mental stuff and how things work is my, my favorite thing. So it's been really, really fun. Well, on, on behalf of IDCTA, I'd just really like to thank you for your time. And this has been a pleasure and we hope to have you back soon. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. I love you, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> <Your daughter. Yes. laughs> well, very good. You have, a, you have a lot of fans out there. I love Abigail, that. thank you again. It was great seeing you again. Thanks. Great to yep. see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.